point in order to treat them as badly as possible and maximize the difference between you and them. Uh, are these chaos schemes clear, more or less? Okay, so there's three. This one's equal and it's high joint profit for the two of you and the one outgroup person. This one, the two of you in the in-group make more and the outgroup person makes less. This one, the two of you don't make as much as here, uh, but the outgroup does very poorly, so you're doing way better than that. Yes? It seems kind of silly. They're testing out a theory, social identity theory. There's nothing silly about that. <laughs> Science. When Galileo dropped balls, you know, Apple Tower, did you say, no, I just made that up, Tower of Pisa, Lean Tower of Pisa, which you didn't do, but you call that silly? You didn't, did you? It was science. <laughs> is that not fair? Is that not fair? Okay, it seems silly. Your point is, what are these people thinking, right? They're in this very silly circumstance. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 I mean, basically, yeah. Okay, so the question is, question is, I mean, maybe I should get this when I'm done presenting the study, but uh, the question is, isn't, it, isn't this silly? Isn't this all silly? <laughs> isn't all of it ridiculous? <laughs> and in a way it is. Uh, uh, no, no, specifically, isn't it silly to bring these 14, 15 year olds in and say, okay, you're, you're, what are your favorite paintings? Now give money to one another. Uh, and of course that is very silly. Uh, I think the excuse for it is that though it's an artificial and weird situation, it is one that uh, tests the theory very well. Uh, we're interested in whether uh, the even tiny, tiny, trivial basis of group difference, the painting preference, will lead to favoritism even with valued resources. You know, like kids, they love money because money can be traded for candy. So you know that they care about the money. And, uh, and so in that way, it's a nice test of this injury favoritism outgroup derogation thing. Uh, and it's also very easy to measure. When you have money, you know, you know exactly the amount that was allocated both ways. So you can measure it very tightly. Whereas if you were trying to say, how much do they insult them? How, do they, how much do they belittle them? And when they speak about the in-group versus the out-group, that would be a little bit tougher to measure. You'd have to code it uh, and all that stuff. That might be good, but it would be just a little bit tougher to do. So that's why they did it that way. What's the sacrifice? The sacrifice is maybe these subjects think the whole thing is weird and they don't act naturally because they find themselves in artificial circumstances. Is this roughly something like the critique or? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I take the critique to be uh, in this very strange unnatural circumstance, and maybe they are. And so uh, we should look across studies for demonstrations that are outside the lab, that are not in artificial circumstances, that are in more sort of fully realized, uh, you know, naturally occurring situations. We aren't worried that people are just acting weirdly uh, or following some very strange instructions in the lab or something like that. Uh, and in a way, that's kind of the idea here. Is they thought they already saw the basic principle of in-group, intergroup conflict out in the field, and then they want to do an experiment to capture some of them. So, uh, so that's my answer to that. Not necessarily the best answer to that. What instructions they give them? I don't. I don't really. I don't really remember. Um, I have read the paper a long time ago. Good question. Yes. It's not the same thing. So, it's a good question. What's the difference between this and this? Maximum profit for the outgroup and maximum difference. So, maximum profit for the in-group involves the in-group making more than in this condition, the maximum or this, this option of payment, uh, maximum joint profit, and involves the outgroup doing a little bit worse. The maximum difference, uh, I think the in-group makes the same as in this condition, not as much, or sorry, in this payment scheme, not as much in the as in the maximum profit, but the outgroup does way, way worse. So, let's say you're, I've totally lost where you are, by the way, so I'm just speaking off. Okay, here we go. So, uh, let's say you, as a result of this painting preference thing, uh, just love your in-group, and you don't even care about the outgroup, really. You just, you're just like, oh, you know, those of us who love Paul Clay, you know, I, we deserve a lot of money. So, you would take the maximum profit of the in-group, you know, you really care about the outgroup guy. If you, as a result of painting preference, were like, man, you like Paul Clay is an idiot, you know, an inferior, not deserving our money, and I need to demonstrate how much better we are uh, than them, then you pay like a competitive payment scheme, one that maximizes the difference, that communicates, uh, we're way, I'm way better than you are. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? So this one maximizes the difference, and this one just maximizes the profit of the group. question. Right. Uh, were the kids forced to give out all their money? Uh, no. They were, they were picking like three, I should just put the freaking numbers over here. Why didn't I have the numbers over here? Okay. Uh, and I don't remember where they were, they picked like eight years ago. So, uh, did the kids give out all the money? They didn't. In this in this payment schedule scheme, they give out all the money. The maximum joint profit. It's like you know three equal payments of nine ninety nine or whatever. You know. And then uh, in this one, there's less. No, no. This one uh, involves less total payoff and uh, more the ingroup and less the outgroup. This one is less still, but it's uh, maximizes the difference between ingroup and outgroup. Gosh, you guys are tough. I mean, really tough. I oof. Yes. Oof. Man. Clobbered. Yeah. Yes. So we're getting that in like two weeks. So don't get Yeah. It is. No, no, it's, it's a really good study too. We're gonna talk about it in class. Yeah, yeah. I like that study a lot. Uh, I fit it into. Okay, well, I'm not even. Okay, so the question is, isn't there this other study that's really awesome that's out in the field, you know, outside the lab that has similar findings and is it awesome? And it is awesome. Uh, but we're gonna get to it in like two weeks in the status section, I think, of the class. Because I, while I agree with it, it speaks to these dynamics for sure, I use it to, to communicate something else. So yeah. Uh, excellent question. We might also watch that film. It's called like, Class Divided. How many people have seen the Class Divided? Ooh, yeah. It's a good film, right? It's a good film. Okay. So what were the results of this study? This crazy, crazy study. Um, okay. So everyone would be best off with a maximum joint profit, but actually the participants favored maximum in-group profit, uh, also known as MIP. And then. Uh, this is, in general, their preferences, uh, or this is like the rate of, okay, so people pick this one the most, then this one next most, and then this one the least. So people favored, they, their, their favorite payoff was maximum in-group profit, giving the most resources to the in-group, regardless of how much the outgroup got. The next favorite uh, was maximum difference, the competitive one, where the in-group doesn't even do as well as they would have been the maximum in-group profit one, but they do way better than the outgroup. And then finally, pulling up the rear is the maximum profit for everybody, which is, you know, the best way to just do right by everybody. But uh, these kids were so obsessed with Vasily Kandinsky and or Paul Clay, whatever they chose, that they, uh, they, they, they put that one last. That was their least favorite, the one where everybody makes the most money, which is really, really interesting, I think. Partly because, I mean, what kind of kids in the 70s are that into Vasily Kandinsky or Paul Clay, you know? Um, but, I mean, it's, uh, it's used as, a, as, as example, the minimal group, uh, it's called the minimal group paradigm, because it's a minimal condition for making a, a group difference that people will attach significance to. Just your preferences on modern art paintings, even if you're freaking 14 years old and presumably don't care that much about modern art, can trigger these sorts of dynamics. Uh, yes, question?
Uh, are, are they maybe are there maybe demand effects in the study? Is it the case that maybe these kids are intimidated by the experimenters, are kind of picking up on what they think the experimenters want them to do, and are therefore conforming to that? Uh, I have I guess three answers to that. Uh, one is uh, maybe you know and let's look at further evidence you know for in-group favoritism in different settings and see if some of that will then eliminate that concern or address that concern. Uh, because ultimately no study is perfect, and I would never tell you that this study is perfect, but we would get closer to the truth across you know several studies. Uh, a second answer would be I would think it'd be just as likely that they think that they're being pressured to give the equal, most profitable to everybody outcome. You know, in general, adults don't want you to be really mean to other kids that you play with. They're always telling you to stop beating up the other kids with like a, a truck or something or whatever. Uh, there's obviously some flashback from my childhood coming out. Uh, but uh, so I would say it'd be just as likely to guess that they're being pressured to do the maximum joint profit. And then actually a third point, and this is really the best response to that question and why I'm glad you asked the question, was this was originally a control condition. This was supposed to be a condition that didn't create group differences. They were actually interested in, in the original experiment, some other more meaningful way to create group differences. And then they were like, oh, we need a control condition with a basis of group difference that nobody will care about. So let's just use painting preferences. I mean, they're 14-year-old kids. What do they know about Vasily Kandinsky, right? I mean, I'm 31. What do I know about Vasily Kandinsky? So uh, this was actually intended as a control condition. And then they found almost the same levels of in-group favoritism and out-group derogation in this setting. And so they were like, wow, this, this effect is stronger than we ever realized. And then Henri Tosh did 35 more years of research on this because he settled on something great. Uh, so it really wasn't the pressure from the, uh, from the experimenters. Not, if they were accurately guessing what the experiment was thinking, the thinking, this won't create group differences. Yeah. So, sorry. Uh, has this research ever been conducted in a uh, communist or socialist or egalitarian country? I'm stealing your thing. Uh, uh, I don't know. It has been done in collectivist uh, Asian societies. In, in fact, I collaborated with uh, Toshio Yamagishi on a test of this uh, in Japan, and the results were sort of muddy. But, uh, but <laughs> so basically, social identity theory works uh, in Asia as well as in the US. So there's conflicting evidence on whether uh, it works more or less. Uh, so, you know, yeah. And I tried, I tried to get a really rigorous answer to that exact question, but I failed miserably. Um, which isn't Toshio's fault, I guess, very smart. Okay. Uh, so people were willing to forgo profits to deprive the outgroup uh, in favoring the maximum uh, uh, difference versus the maximum joint profit. So in this one, the in group would have makes less than here, but they actually take it more because they get to make the outgroup make even, even less, like a very low payoff. And so these kids are being very mean to each other. They're like high art critics. It's like a fight, like a fist fight in the SF MoMA in this experiment. Um, and uh, I think we can all relate to that. So uh, this experiment, or this setting, is called the minimal group setting or the minimal group paradigm because they found a minimal basis for creating in group favoritism. There's barely any group differentiation going on in this study, and yet the kids really cling to it and take to it. So now you're thinking, well, okay, so minimal group setting started the control condition, but they discovered they can make groups almost nothing. Yes? The next question. So does this experiment suggest that humans have a natural tendency to see difference first rather than similarity? It may mean that. I would say it a little bit differently, which is that this experiment implies that humans uh, attach surprisingly large significance to even small trivial differences. Um, so uh, if, if they saw two groups that were literally identical and equal, they probably wouldn't differentiate them. But even very small differences will be turned into you know, significant ones subjectively in people's heads. A very similar point. Here, point. Um, yes? Did you say Willer said that? Did you say that? No, what did you say? Uh, I didn't, can you repeat your question? I thought, I thought you said that I said something really fun. Ah, uh, that's okay. That's complicated. Okay, so the question was, uh, hasn't there been research showing that in-group versus after differences are bigger in collectivist societies? I would say yes, there has been evidence of that. There's also been evidence in the exact opposite direction. And there's also been evidence that uh, collectivist societies are more open to overarching identities that then reduce those group differences. So it's hard to make you know, totalistic claims about collectivist versus individualist societies in which ones uh, are, are bigger in terms of how they conform to social identity theory. I mean, if I had to put a bet on what the next 20 years of data will say, it would be that collectivist societies, uh, for example, Asian, Asian culture, uh, East Asian cultures, would be a little bit more uh, conforming to the principles of social identity theory. But you know, the evidence is real conflicting so far, so I want to make you know, measured conclusions from that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and we'll move on. So the question is, uh, are there ways in which uh, differences between people can stimulate cooperation? Uh, like, for example, people filling complementary roles or something like that, like different positions on the basketball team or something like that. And uh, I think it's a cool question. It's a very sociological question, a very Durkheimian question. Like in the division of labor, you know, can group differences cue something like the division of labor, which would lead to greater group productivity uh, or societal productivity? And uh, yeah, I think so. Um, generally, when you do these small group experiments and you create a group difference that isn't attached to different roles, though, it tends to undermine cooperation and lead to more uh, in-group favoritism and out-group derogation. You know what I'm saying? But uh, when they create other sorts of experiments where you have complementary roles in teams, then yeah, uh, 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 certain sorts of arrangements of complementary roles in teams can definitely facilitate higher levels of productivity. I basically translate what you said in sociology speak, right? Oh, yeah. Like, okay. So, uh, okay, another study that talks about social identity theory or species of social identity theory, you probably remember this graph from just a couple lectures ago, from the obedience lecture, where we were talking about the Milgram experiment and the replications of the Milgram experiment that came afterwards. And in this study, what they did was they took white participants, and yeah, they took white participants, and then brought them to the Milgram obedience study, and then the person that they were supposed to teach, the person who was supposed to repeat the word pairs back, was either uh, experimentally determined to be white or black. Uh, and this was random. So 50% of the time, if you're a participant in the study, you walk in, and you're randomly assigned to have a white uh, a victim of your shocks, or a black victim, the other 50% of the time. And what they found was, in a control condition, just a normal Milgram obedience study kind of setting, uh, the black victim is actually shocked a little bit less on average, though I don't know that this difference is statistically significant. But uh, the normal thing would be for the subjects to shock the white participant, maybe, or the white uh, victim, learner they call them in the study, uh, a little bit more. However, if they arrange to have the learner uh, briefly insult the subject prior to the study, uh, while they're in the waiting room together, like six insulting, then that triggers, uh, or well, this is the interpretation, that triggers a basis of group difference, racial differences, and then subjects are much meaner to a black victim than they are to a white victim. Remember, all participants in the study were white. So normally, you know, they weren't showing in group favoritism, they weren't shocking the white target, the white victim less, in fact, they shocked them a little bit more. Um, but when something in the situation made these group differences salient, uh, then that led to uh, in-group favoritism and out-group derogation, or rather nasty kind, right? Like electric shocks that might kill a person. Uh, any questions about that?
And this is that we talked about we've come a long way from the minimal group paradigm, right? Like the minimal group, minimal group paradigm is about 14 to 15 year olds allocating money based on painting preferences. And you might be thinking, wow, what does that matter? You know, and what, how does that speak to it? major group conflicts like wars? But then this one really starts to speak to it, right? You have a group difference that's sitting there that could be active. It isn't uh, having any effect normally. But then one insult triggers that group, group difference, and then uh, subject became more likely to essentially kill the victim uh, from another racial group. Okay, questions about that? Okay, uh, 74, continuing with the race and ethnicity uh, theme as a basis of group difference. It's just one basis of group difference. Obviously, painting preferences is another one, uh, but we'll go with this one for a little while. Uh, Sidanius et al. in 2004 conducted a study at UCLA, which is, I think, one of our satellite schools, and then they found. <coughs> I've heard of their work. I don't know. I've heard of them around. They, uh, they supposedly play basketball. So, uh, okay, so this was conducted at UCLA, uh, where, and it was motivated by a couple observations that. <coughs> In higher education over the last 40 years or so, there's been this huge increase in racial and ethnic diversity on college campuses. We now have incredibly diverse college campuses, at least in the UC system in California. Can you all please be quiet back there? Those of you who are talking? You, 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 and you. Stop talking now. Thank you. And please don't talk about me telling you to stop talking. Okay. Um, I have to add that one now. It's kind of ridiculous. Okay. So, uh, this is looking at two observations. There's been this huge increase in racial and ethnic diversity on college campuses, uh, but there's still limited intermixing across racial and ethnic lines. Uh, there's some, but perhaps not as much not as, much as you expect by chance. People aren't equally likely to interact with people of their own uh, or similar racial ethnic group as a very different one. Instead, we see great homophily. What's homophily? People tending to like and hang out with similar uh, others. And the homophily is beyond racial and ethnic lines on college campuses. Okay. And Sidanius et al. had this idea that maybe ethnic organizations and fraternities and sororities are part of that. Maybe they are a group, or they are available groups that uh, are part of the reason that undergraduate students find themselves segregated into separate social, uh, separate so social networks. So, but note, obvious caveats at the top, there's good things about grads and sororities and ethnic organizations, yeah, 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 I'm not bashing these organizations, nor is Sidanius, well, I'm really not, I'm just reporting what Sidanius did, but Sidanius isn't either. Note, ethnic organizations have demonstrated positive effects, such as comfort with identity, interaction with faculty, and sense of belonging, they also play a critical role in the integration of college campuses, and then also student groups in general foster social connections and can reduce isolation, uh, so these are great things. But, there might be another side to this, and that is that the effects of membership were essentially the same for minority and white students in this study. Um, they found that greater ethnic identification, like when they surveyed people and asked, how much do you identify as your racial and ethnic group, people that were higher in this tended to then be more likely to join these groups. So people higher in identification as white were more likely to join fraternities and sororities, people more, uh, higher in identification as, say, Asian American were more likely to join Asian American group, or African American more likely to join African American group, and so on. Um, and then, in turn, there was a reciprocal effect where membership in these groups then further increased within group identification. So you might join uh, a Latino student organization in part because you're a highly identified Latino, and then as a result of being in that group later, your identification as Latino relative to those who don't join the organization has increased. Uh, many of you are going like, uh, yeah, that's kind of obvious. Okay. So, but they did research, and they really showed it, you know? So now you can really believe what you already knew. Um, uh, membership, this is more interesting probably, membership also led to an increased sense of ethnic victimization. So there was a, uh, when people would answer surveys saying to what extent do you feel like your group is mistreated by other groups on campus or is uh, mistreated by the university as a whole or the climate is opposed to your ethnic group, uh, when, they, uh, when they had participated in these groups, they tended to answer those higher. Now, no, there's no necessary, there's no saying who's right or wrong in answering these questions. These are subjective perceptions of reality. And, uh, and so who knows, maybe membership in these groups made them more accurate and they really were being victimized. I don't know. But uh, the point is that group membership led to an increase in this relative to those who didn't join the groups. And this is interesting. So even you know, people joining fraternities and sororities were more likely, or white people joining fraternities and sororities were more likely to say that they felt that their ethnic group was victimized on the college campus. Um, and then it also decreased a sense of common identity and social inclusiveness for the whole campus. So people who join these groups were less likely to say um, that we, you know, as, as UCLA students in general, share some common identity. The people who did not join these organizations were more likely to say, or rated, you know, uh, were higher on, yes, we are all, you know, some big group. Um, questions? Okay. Ah, yes, questions. So ethnic identification would be a series of questions like, it is, uh, so say it was uh, African American ethnic identification, racial ethnic identification. It would be like, uh, being African American is an important part of who I am. Um, uh, okay, I, I remember that one. Um, uh, it is important to me to be African American, um, and so on. Questions like that, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, they'd be more likely to, or, or less likely? Right, okay, so yeah, so what predicts uh, joining uh, a racial ethnic organization that is not your, does not correspond with your race or ethnicity? I don't know, I don't know. There, there probably is some research there on that, uh, but I, I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, so uh, we'll do study five. We'll do study five. This is one of my favorite studies in this entire uh, class. It's a really good one. Okay, so. Oh, and this study was done by Levine et al. And actually, the fourth author on this paper is the cousin of Michael Burroughboy, a sociology professor here, one of my colleagues in the department. And uh, I don't know, that's, that's just a random thing I'm telling you. I don't know why. Um, but I was telling him about the study, and he was like, you know, he was like, that's my cousin, blind. So, uh, so study one. Um, and his cousin actually does really, really kick-ass social identity theory research, so he's, he's really awesome. Um, okay, so study one. They were interested in, uh, kind of like the, the replication of the Milgram experiment with racial differences that are triggered by an insult, they were interested in how extreme can the effects of social identity theory be? You know, you had all these lab demonstrations where people were kids or whoever allocate resources in these strange artificial circumstances. You know, what if you took this outside the lab and look and study real behavior out there? Uh, and then also, you know, more meaningful behavior, you know, like something where people might be getting hurt. Um, this, is, this is why I'm getting excited about this stuff. So uh, in study one, what they did was they recruited, and they started with undergraduates on a college campus, I think you'll see that they, the study ended up going beyond your typical lab study. Uh, they recruited football fans uh, from some university in Britain. They were undergraduate students at some, uh, at some university in Britain, and they were football fans, which apparently means that they were soccer fans, and I don't understand, you know, whatever. I don't so they were soccer fans, but they called them football fans. Very confusing. And then uh, specifically, they were uh, Manchester United fans. And so they asked people. Uh, so everybody's a football fan in in, uh, in in United or really everywhere but the United States. Everybody's a football fan, and they need the other kind of football. And they uh, put up uh, these surveys that said, "Are you like a big football fan? If so, would you like to participate in the study?" And you know, they couldn't. You know, people were breaking the door down to participate in the study. So, um, but they asked them, "What's your favorite team on the sign-up page?" And from that. From that list, that roster, they just picked the Manchester United fans. Uh, so, are you, are you all familiar with Manchester United, this team? So, they used to be like this really blue collar team, but now they're like the New York Yankees.